Hi everyone, a warm welcome. This is Anders Bennett speaking live uh, from uh, from Brussels, or more specifically from Waterloo. From so here is me. Hopefully you can see me. This is our uh, beautiful bedroom slash working corner, and uh, just like most of you, I'm staying at home thanks to our uh, beloved and not so beloved uh, situation which uh, confines everyone to their home uh, for public health, public safety. I want to make sure that you can see me uh, properly and I'd like to get a confirmation from my colleagues in Budapest who are kind enough to be helping with technical assistance uh, that the sound and everything is good. Okay, confirmation is there. Fantastic. Why don't you just put into a chat box which country or which city you are following this event from and hopefully everything will be fine. So I can see a lot of Brussels, Italy, Greece, Luxembourg, Paris. This is outstanding. Vienna from literally all over Europe. This is uh, fascinating. And uh, soon I'll be turning off the camera because uh, it's probably interesting to look at me and see that this is all live and happening now. And you might even see my kids running in the back and asking for some hot chocolate. But I'd rather focus on today's topic, which is working for or with the EU, looking at careers, looking at, uh, at, at, at possibilities of securing an interesting EU affairs job, whether that's in the realm of EU institutions or outside, but still working on European topics. So with that, I say uh, bye to the video feed and let's get started with the events. If there's any technical concern, please do address it uh, directly to our technical team. Lenke and Veronica are helping me from Budapest. Uh, so this is truly fascinating, a virtual event with uh, several hundred attendees. And I'm truly honored that you took your time off from uh, supervising your kids or looking at Netflix videos to deal with these topics. So with that, let's start it and let's look at the different career options that I'll outline <clears throat> for you briefly. My background, you might know, I uh, wrote the book, The Ultimate EU Test Book, whose latest edition, the 2020 editions just came out. So it's been 15 years in the making. That's uh, very, very exciting. And uh, there is the EU training website where you registered and you're familiar with. And I do a couple of other things uh, dealing with the Public Affairs Council. In Europe, it's a, a nonprofit uh, organization and uh, uh, company called Speaker Hub. So with that, uh, sound check should be fine. <clears throat> we'll skip this slide and get right into it. So some of you may have seen this poster, which we did, oh my God, eight years ago. That's quite some time, uh, but I think it holds uh, true ever since. It's about the perception on EU officials, why some people think that uh, EU officials are running around with uh, the top level politicians which in 2012 were quite different from what we have now. Uh, what my friends think I do is that uh, they are partying and enjoying life uh, at, at uh, parties, which even for social distancing would be difficult to do. What society thinks I do as EU official is uh, dealing with money or perhaps even more nefarious ways of handling that money. Others might think, uh, or the boss might think that you're not doing much. Uh, what the family or wife thinks, uh, you are just overwhelmed with dossiers. But what uh, many EU officials and others in offices actually do is deleting emails. So this is just a, a little uh, segue into the main topic of today and looking at the different European career options. I'd like to start with this chart because the most important question when you're looking for a job in European affairs, and I define European affairs in a very broad term, as dealing with EU policies, EU institutions, funding, advocacy, lobbying, interest representation, dealing with the shaping of uh, EU budget, of foreign issues, of environment policies, of climate action, or economic recovery. All of these are broadly under the term of uh, political matters on the European level. If you'd like to deal with these topics and find a career in European careers, uh, well, that was a little bit of a <coughs> tautology. So find a career in European affairs. It's very important to understand what sort of selection method each of these organizations that you're aiming to find a job at is actually using. EU institutions typically use 
EPSO competitions, European Personal Selection Office competitions, which are centralized. And their aim is to create a reserve list where you can be recruited from. So they are not recruiting directly. EPSO is not a recruitment agency. They do the selection of suitable future officials. On the other hand, EU agencies, they rarely use EPSO for their selection. There are exceptions. The IP office in Alicante, it's um, uh, the IP office in Alicante sometimes uses it and some other agencies, but typically they use their own selection methods. <clears throat> and then EU consultancies are private sector organizations, even think tanks and nonprofits and others. They typically don't use any EU institution help, which is, of course, understandable because they're independent from the institutions. <clears throat> and then when it comes to their own system, you can see that EU institutions, uh, the European Commission, European Parliament and others typically uh, go to EPSO. The agencies typically have their own individual methods, which is hard to say anything meaningful about what sort of selection the European Union agencies use in general. So we did a study about this a few years ago, which we probably need to refresh because let's say the European Plant Variety Office or the European Food Safety Authority or the European Medicines Agency and the several dozen other agencies, they typically have their own systems, which includes a call for applications, a CV, and then some sort of vetting of the applications. When it comes to EU consultancies, think tanks, diplomatic bodies, they also have their own systems and that's something we'll come back to quite shortly. And then this is just a, a basic overview of the type of method. So the bottom line here is make sure you understand what selection method is being used and focus your energy in preparing for that because this is what will grant you success. So I like to use this term or this way of splitting today's conversation into two parts, which is working for the institutions and working with the institutions. By institutions, I mean the European Union institutions, as European Commission, European Parliament, European Court of Auditors, European Court of Justice, and uh, many others. Working with means that you are not inside an EU institution, not an EU official, you're not a temporary agent, you're not even a trainee, but you work closely with those institutions as a political advisor or as a diplomat or as a consultant or as an NGO activist. So let's look at both ways, the kind of jobs that there you can find out there. Now, EU careers and working for the institutions is typically, as uh, most of you would certainly know it, through passing the EPSO or EU agency exams. So these are the exams that you must pass in order to secure a permanent job, or when it comes to even temporary jobs, these are the kind of exams you may need to sit as well. <clears throat> What sort of positions are out there? So once you're an EU official, what is it that you are going to be doing? Well, as diverse as any national administration or any public administration. In administrative terms, you can be a trainee, you can be a temporary agent or a contract agent. These are two separate terms with slightly different employment conditions and uh, the jackpot the, 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 the jolly joker of jobs is the permanent official because this is open-ended and uh, not a fixed term contract that you can be given. Trainees are taken in by the European Commission, European Parliament and other institutions as well, but mostly European Commission and Parliament, uh, the Economic and Social Committee, Committee and the Committee of Regions, uh, usually on a every six months. So every six months, you would have a, an intake of trainees where the traineeship lasts five months and it's paid. Uh, they pay, if I'm not mistaken, around 1,200 euros 
which uh, depending on where you live can sound like a lot and sound like a medium level uh, salary, but it's still a, a very decent pay for a traineeship to sustain your living each month in Brussels. This is the European Commission figure as far as I know, and I don't think there is any age limit, at least certainly not upwards. Probably there is a, a requirement as far as I know to, be, to have at least a, a bachelor degree or perhaps a master's degree. Uh, there are all the conditions are on the website. So if you just Google uh, EU uh, traineeship or European Commission traineeship, you will get the information you need. Temporary contract agents are often selected uh, based on a database. So the contract agents have a database, the CAST, so C A S T, that the contract agent for specific task database. And once you register there, and your profile gets picked by a service, by a commission department or, or another institution's department that's interested in, in you to sit an EPSO exam. So you need to sit abstract verbal numerical reasoning tests and you can be then shortlisted for interview. Temporary agents are often picked based uh, again on a specific call for a specific job. And there you send in your application, your cover letter and your CV. And then there's a permanent official, which requires the EPSO exams that we focus so much on at EU training, because that's our bread and butter, our core mission to help you prepare for those EPSO exams. But going back for a second, what kind of jobs would you be doing as an EU official? As I said before, as diverse as it gets, because the EU deals with so many things, uh, a scientific expert, you could be a trade negotiator, you could be a policy officer, or if you go for assistant jobs, you could be dealing with financial project management, uh, contract management, you could be dealing uh, with uh, secretarial clerical jobs if you apply for a secretary uh, exam. So it's very, very diverse depending on which DG, director general, you are actually uh, placed in. And how does the actual EPSO exam work? As you remember, I just said a few moments ago, this is for the permanent job. So <clears throat> most people, even if they get into the institutions as trainees or get into the institutions as contract agent or temporary agent, they are eligible to sit these competitions. Obviously, everyone else is eligible to sit these competitions as well. So if you have nothing to do with EU institutions right now because you're working as a nurse in uh, in, in Romania or you're working as, an, as a management assistant in Sweden, you are just as uh, eligible to sit these competitions. Certainly, there are formal criteria that you can take part, but this is an open competition where anyone with an EU citizenship and with some other basic criteria can apply. Now, what does it require? Typically, there are annual cycles. Now, with the, the, the coronavirus situation, everything is quite messed up. So it's a lot of uncertainty how these annual cycles will play out this year or perhaps even next year. But exams will be announced. So this is certain because EU institutions need staff. Some people will retire, some people will quit the job, some people will take unpaid leaves or medical leaves. So uh, the show must go on, the institutions must operate and they need staff to do that. So there are regular announcements of EU competitions. Then there is always a notice of competition where that's where the EU institutions or more specifically the personal selection office announces that there is a new competition where they are seeking applicants for. This is also announced on their website and we at EU Training are following all these developments and will be the first to tell you as soon as the official information is out, well, sometimes even before because we have uh, many good friends at different places who tell us uh, some ideas occasionally that this competition, this event is coming and you should be interested. We put that on Facebook, we put that in our newsletter and in different channels. Once there's a notice of competition, they will announce the pre-selection exams. So there will be pre-selection exams. That's typically the abstract verbal numerical reasoning tests. 
and there might be some slight variations there, but typically these are the three kind of tests that candidates will be required to sit. And then uh, there is the admission. So once you've passed those tests and your documents regarding your diploma, regarding your citizenship, and some other basic criteria are checked and are fine, you can get admitted to the exam. And there used to be, and we don't know whether that's going to continue, but there used to be in some exams another phase of an E-Tray exercise. So an E-Tray exam, which is a computer-based uh, test. And there also used to be another type of test called situational judgment tests. But these are probably not going to be the case for upcoming exams. And then once you've passed these, these, this part, comes an assessment center, which in, in practice is basically the second exam in the course of the competitions or the second step where you are required to go to Brussels, in some cases to Luxembourg, but typically to Brussels to participate in a day long set of tests where you need to give an oral presentation or a structured interview or a group exercise, uh, occasionally even a case study or even some additional tests to show your skills and competencies in order to prove that you are eligible for an EU job. So, or not just eligible, but you're suitable for an EU job. So with that, if everything goes well, you get placed on the reserve list. And from that point, you can be recruited. So this is a cycle and it typically takes around nine months. But again, with the caveat that now with the virus situation, uh, there are a lot of, lot of um, delays and changes and, and, and uh, rescheduling. So this is the typical timeline and we'll see how that plays out in the next few months. So let me take uh, uh, just a moment of pause. I see that there are many questions coming in. Uh, first and foremost, I probably won't have time to answer all the questions. Whatever question I don't have time to answer, we'll, we'll follow that up with a note. We'll follow that up with uh, perhaps a blog post or some similar format, but every question will get an answer. So keep your eyes out for, for our updates and your question will be answered. And if you have any follow-up question or need more information, just send us an email to our customer support and my colleagues will be more than happy to help you and more than happy to assist you with your specific personalized inquiry. So let me take uh, one or two questions and then I go on to the rest of the presentation. Can you give us an example of an EU consultancy? Absolutely, I'll come back to that in a second half, so I won't address it now. What EU careers can a lawyer follow in general? Well, a lawyer can certainly go, when it comes to the EU institutions, lawyers uh, are fairly well-placed because public administration and uh, even lawyer exams are quite regular. And even in this, for, for 2020, there's a plan to have lawyer competitions. And even with a law degree, you can do even other profiles as, uh, as financial project manager or dealing with, uh, with even foreign policy for that matter, or uh, development aid. Other questions, is there an age limit for trainees? I think I answered that. How does your profile get picked from CUST, so from the contract agent database? We have a dedicated webinar on that, and the recording and the transcript is on our website. It uh, was a free event that we did with my colleague Anna. So you can find a lot of questions and answers when it comes to the CUST exams, uh, and my colleagues will certainly put the link into the chat box in a moment. What is the best way to prepare for EPSO exams, the EU training website or the ultimate EU test book? Now, the selfish and self-centered and uh, business-oriented me says, obviously, you need to buy both because uh, I am participating in both ventures. But uh, seriously speaking, and, and in all transparency and honesty, you, well, the candidates typically use my book, the EU test book, to understand the process and dig deep into the preparation whereas our website typically helps most candidates to practice specifically for the exam because we do realistic uh, time uh, bound and 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 uh, 
through exam simulations on the website so you can really see how you would perform under pressure at the real event. So in practice, obviously, it's your choice whether, whether you prefer a book format or an online format uh, or, or both. But uh, certainly, the information is packaged in a different way when it comes to print or when it comes to the online version. Uh, what else? Um, pa, pa, pa. How do you get a temporary contract in an EU delegation? Mm, that's quite a specific uh, question. Most EU delegations are, uh, they advertise specific jobs on their website, occasionally in the European External Action Service website. So those would be publicly made available and then you apply. Uh, often you can get those EU delegation jobs after you have worked at one of the institutions, typically the Council of Ministers, the, the Council of the EU, or the European Commission, and you can be seconded, you can be sent to an EU delegation. All right, let me go on to the next part to make sure that I cover everything that we planned for today. Oops, there we go. So very quickly, three tips to EPSO exam success, and these are quite random tips. You will find lots of free information in our eBooks, uh, free tips and articles, and and, and free webinars on our website. So do look out for those. But three random tips how to optimize your EPSO chances. One is to make sure that you to choose a specialist profile. So if your, your background is in, uh, say, natural sciences, you have a de degree in physics, you probably would be eligible for some specialist profiles or jobs at some EU agencies that look for natural sciences degrees. And there, typically, the competition, the number of other candidates, is much lower than for broad and very wide competitions like the public administration, even the lawyer exams. Another idea is make sure that you choose your exam language very carefully. A lot of candidates uh, get confused by the language regime. We talk about language one and language two when it comes to EPSO exams. And language one is your your mother tongue, as long as it's an EU official language, so one of the 24 official languages of the EU. And uh, language two is, well, typically English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. But there's a slight variation because of a court case that this is not always these five, but typically these are the five most, so to say, popular or most chosen languages. So that would be your language two in which you need to do the assessment center. And if you speak multiple languages, you can play around a little bit what you choose as language one and language two, which certainly affects your performance. Just uh, one quick advice there. Typically, the pre-selection tests are done in your language one. And that should be a language where you can read and passively analyze information very quickly. Language two would typically be a language in which you can express yourself in writing and in speaking orally the, in the most fluent way. So if you have the luxury of choosing language one and language two because you speak multiple languages, consider these aspects. So tip number two, master the method methodology. It, it is complicated exams. There's a lot of process in it, and then there's a lot of uh, small pieces of information you should be aware of. And there is a methodology to it, just like uh, any sports activity or any skill or a language. You can get better by understanding certain shortcuts and heuristics and uh, ideas to master the system. So we have a lot, a lot of training materials there. We have uh, pre-selection reasoning tests uh, and assessments and materials, a lot of free webinars as well on methodology. Others for the more advanced level are going to be paid. All of this is, uh, there's a system to it. So here's a list of all the things that we offer. You can review it when we send you out the slides. And many of you would immediately find this on our website as well. Same thing for the assessment center with webinars. And we also do a lot of lot of cl classroom training and case study simulations and even personal coaching. Again, given the virus situation in Belgium and in other parts of Europe, 
uh, we had to suspend it, but this is not going to be forever. So I hope that uh, in a few weeks or at best or, or at worst in a few months, we will resume with all those in-person trainings as well. And then number three, make a plan. Do not just jump into practicing. Do not just jump into your desire of securing an EU job and hoping for the best. Make sure that you have a plan what you're going to practice on which days of the week. Regularity becomes very important. Really look at it as if this were a preparation for a marathon or preparation for some sports competition or some uh, chess uh, competition, any other challenge that uh, you wish to pick. As long as you have a plan, you will be able to advance towards it and measure your progress, which is just as important. And this is something that our system really does very well. It shows you how you have been improving as a result of your studies. OK, uh, two small tips or sub tips here. You can create a study group with a few friends. And there are great uh, tools for that. Uh, even you can coordinate this on our platform or on various Facebook groups. But as long as you have a peer group, they will motivate you. They will push you to not give up and advance towards your goal. And the timeline and preparation is something I mentioned before. And then talking about those Facebook groups and different communities, there are uh, specific groups for each of the exams that uh, EPSO has announced. And all of this uh, you can join, you can participate, you can share ideas, rumors, uh, frustrations, good news. All of this happens in those dedicated groups. So with that, let me take uh, one or two more questions. And we're just at half time, which is pretty good. And then we'll transit to the working with looking at career options outside EU institutions. So here's a quickly question. Is there, is there an economic difference in working in the Brussels or in Luxembourg? Certainly there is, because Luxembourg is more expensive. So on the, the, the purchase power of your salary, is different in Luxembourg compared to Brussels because uh, the cost of living is just simply higher. Renting an apartment is uh, more expensive. So there's a difference. If you'd like to look at a more funny take on that, I wrote an article many, many years ago. Uh, I think maybe my colleagues can find it, but you could Google that of Brussels or Luxembourg and you just put EU training. Then there is a comparison of the two cities because I had the uh, the, the fortune of living in both and working in both for EU institutions many, many years ago. So I did uh, a, a light touch comparison. Can you work for the EU if you are from a non-EU country? Uh, that's difficult. Uh, depends on which non-EU country you're from. So if you are from a, a, a European economic area country, say Norway, there might be some tiny, tiny little loopholes in the system that they allow you to work perhaps as a seconded national expert or a temporary agent. So it's not unheard of. If you are coming from, let's say, United States, uh, uh, yeah, you, you might be a, an external advisor to someone in the commission, or you could be sort of a, an external consultant on contract with the commission, but you cannot be staff as part of the administration. So from a non-EU country, it can be very difficult. Accession countries, so Western Balkans countries, which most of whom are, are considered as candidate countries, there might be certain flexibility there. But if you're coming, say, from Latin America or, or from Central Asia or, or from Asia, for that matter, it's uh, not possible, to the best of my knowledge, to work directly for the EU institutions. Uh, what can I do to boost my CV for an EU career? Well, my very, very good news to you and anyone else who's interested in boosting their CV is that we have a dedicated webinar, completely free, coming up in our series during lockdown that I'm running each week. So we'll be announcing it very soon. Actually, it's been announced already, but we'll be marketing it with more visibility in the coming days. Uh, so watch out for that. Make sure to sign up. And uh, I'll be sharing with you a lot of ideas on how to boost your CV. And what else? I'm just uh, randomly checking questions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Are there 
there are any paths to get a job offer being already at the European Commission as a Blue Book trainee? There is certainly a bit more chance to get an EU job. So once you are part of the institutions, even as a trainee, you might, uh, if the timing works out well and you have the right profile because somebody goes on maternity leave, and your boss says, can you cover this person for six months under a temporary contract? Or can you help us out with this particular task, which uh, requires your background or your expertise? So these sort of uh, coincidences or good timing can happen. And uh, if you are already inside the institutions, uh, that can slightly increase your chances. And in procedural terms, it doesn't mean any advantage or disadvantage if somebody is inside or outside the institutions, because as long as you pass the right exam and you go through the right process, you would have those chances. But in all transparency and all honesty, when it comes to the recruitment part, so once you are on the reserve list and a head of unit is looking at eligible candidates that they want to hire, have Having an EU experience is, an, is, a, is a plus, it's an asset. In what terms? Even if you have worked in a national government, in a, in, say you worked in the Czech public administration or you worked in a consultancy in Brussels uh, dealing with uh, managing a, a plastics recycling project, those experiences are very positive because when it comes to the recruitment, again, not the selection, but the recruitment, those experiences are very positive when an institution says, well, this person already understands the EU's way of working, understands how these projects work. That's a plus. So if there are three candidates on the list who are all eligible and you are the one with the most EU experience. That is certainly a big plus in your favor. All right, let me go on. And I know there are many other questions. And as mentioned before, they will all be answered even if not today at the webinar, but in a written memo. So let's look at the working with idea. So working outside the institutions, but still dealing with European matters. And certainly the most common sense approach is that you need to convince the employer with your CV and your profile. That's pretty much what you need to do. Certainly there are a lot of, lot of caveats and, uh, and, and differences depending on which employer we're talking about. So let's look at uh, what your goal is. Your goal is to stand out, to be that red uh, paper ship among the other white paper ships where you want to be noticed for your expertise, for your skills, and for your motivation in working with European matters. And then this is the question I encourage you to ask. Something we'll come back to at our dedicated CV webinar, but what is your unique selling proposition? A very marketing term, the USP, but you need to be very clear on what makes you different from the other candidates. Because many candidates would have a degree in political science, perhaps in law, perhaps in communication, perhaps in, in nuclear physics, who knows, natural sciences or in linguistics, or they are interpreters, but they may not have the knowledge of the EU that you do because you studied that at your university or you went to study for a master's in another country, that is certainly a big plus. Maybe your international network, that you are connected to so many other peers and colleagues that you can use. So if we're talking about uh, an EU a, a research project, let's say now that they are looking for uh, tests to detect the coronavirus and there is an international consortium that needs to be coordinated. So having an international network in place already is a big plus that you may not have thought about as a career asset, but it's certainly something that helps your, your chances of securing a job. Number three, understanding policy and politics. So if you wrote your thesis on EU decision making or you wrote your thesis on uh, the NGO advocacy for environmental matters, so demonstrating your understanding of policy and politics is a big plus that many employers love to see. Languages, obviously, the more, I wouldn't say the more languages you speak, the better, but if you speak the right languages, that's a huge plus. That's typically English, French, and plus one, which might be a more unique language. So if you speak Chinese, if you speak Russian, if you speak Arabic, if you speak 
any other language that is in high demand for specific jobs and projects, that's a huge plus. Subject matter expertise, of course. So if you know everything that is to be known uh, about microplastics, that's great as long as you want to find a job in that specific area. Or if you are an expert in ethics and transparency, well, that's also a big plus if you happen to be looking for a job at, say, Transparency International. And then uh, there's the brand. That's more the, the employment history. So if you work at a company which has a very strong reputation and a strong brand, that can certainly help you. M being mindful that brand is a tricky thing. It can easily change. So let's say uh, Facebook uh, was the number one brand for so many years. But in the past uh, few years, it's got to be tainted given the many scandals that they suffered. So having worked at Facebook, if just for sake of example, looked amazing on your CV. And now it might raise eyebrows for some people and saying, well, were you involved in some of those uh, difficult stories that surfaced in the media? Studies, if you studied at a prestigious university, a well-known one that can add a lot to you, or the kind of projects that you participated in. And then let's look at more specifically the kind of career options that you can have if your desire is to work in European affairs. So the main, or there are three main groups, and one of them is diplomatic jobs. So you could work at permanent representations, which are based in Brussels. All EU member states have one, and non-EU member states have a so-called mission. So let's say there's the Russian mission to the EU, there's a Turkish mission to the EU, there is the uh, Azeri mission to the EU. And to get a job at those, you need to be typically a citizen of that country. Not always, but in most cases. Actually, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine who was a French citizen was working at the British permanent representation, uh, helping more Brits get into EU jobs. And uh, it's not because of her lack of skills that uh, things ended up the way they did, but uh, that was an interesting thing to see a French national working at the British program. And then you have the other representations, whether that's the United Nations, the WHO, or, or uh, the Council of Europe, any other organization would have a representation in Brussels employing lots and lots of people. And SNEs are the second in national experts. They are typically civil servants from their home country who are sent to, not just to Brussels, but to the EU institutions, most often to the European Commission for a year or two years to work on specific projects. So if you are a public health expert in the Bulgarian Ministry of Health, you could be sent to the commission as a second national expert. And then the commission actually tops up your salary with a certain amount of money. It's not that you are getting the same salary as back home, uh, but still employed by your home administration. And then the other big uh, group is the political kind of jobs. So you could be an assistant to a member of the European Parliament. Now with 705 members of the European Parliament, you have around two, each MEP typically has two or three assistants or advisors. So that's around uh, roughly 2000 positions and jobs. Now that we are past the European election, uh, most members of Parliament would already have their uh, office fully staffed but there's certainly some turnover and this is a very interesting career option. You could work for a European parliamentary group, the European People's Party, the European Conservatives and Reformists, you could work for the, 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 the Socialists and Democrats or Renew Europe. All of these political groups have their own secretariats and that is dealing with EU affairs. You may be a temporary agent or you could be just on a contract with those political groups and dealing with European affairs without being an EU official. And then there are the advocacy organizations. So this could be the previously mentioned Transparency International, this could be, this could be really Amnesty International or any other activist organization which has a very strong political agenda, which you need to be familiar with and you need to be supportive of, otherwise you may not be hired 
or otherwise you may be very frustrated in the job. But I consider them political jobs because they have a very strong value set, they have a very strong agenda that they represent. And then you have the third uh, group, the third uh, category, which is, well, broadly the private sector. So you can have think tanks, research think tanks, many economic think tanks. There is one named Bruegel. There's another one called ECIPER, if I'm not mistaken, that's E-C-I-P-E. -E. Um, there are many think tanks on policy. So there's a Center for European uh, Political Studies or Policy Studies, the, the CEPs. Uh, there is the EPC, there are many others, especially in Brussels, that cover European policies, they do research, they do analysis, they do impact assessments to assist European institutions or to do independent studies as well. Consultancies, lots and lots of consultancies in Brussels, uh, from Fleischmann Hillard to the, what was formerly known Burson Marsteller, now it's called BCW, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, in Israel, uh, you have uh, Edelman, many, many consultancies. Some are more focused on public relations and communications. Others are more concentrated on advocacy, lobbying, and directly representing the interests of their members. And there are about 1,600 European level or EU focused trade associations, which uh, each of which are linked to some sector or industry. So you have the Toy Industry Trade Association, you have uh, the Crop Protection Trade Association, you have the Wind Energy Trade Association, you have the, the Heat Pump Trade Association. You can find trade associations for things you never imagined ever existed. And a very important point of finding, especially for private sector organizations, now a little footnote, by private sector, I also include most NGOs and other institutions or organizations that are not linked to the EU. So to find those, you can simply look for the Joint Transparency Register. So the EU's Joint Transparency Register and do searching based on keywords. So you can find organizations you may not have heard of, but they are directly related to your interest or directly related to the topic that you would like to deal with. So that's a pretty helpful directory repository of information. And then through their website, you should see if they have any open jobs. And at our CV and motivation letter writing webinar, we look at the idea or the question whether it's worth sending an application, even if there is no open position, and what are some best practices there? So let's go on and I'll stop for a second uh, before I say, ask yourself, I say, uh, let's see what you asked from me and uh, I'll pick one or two questions before I go on. How does the everyday of working at the commission look like an administrator or for an assistant? And I add to this, aside from deleting emails. Well, it's public administration. So very much depends on whether it's really an office job where you do coordinating or coordination of a project and you are working in DG Move on the most, let's say, the upcoming legislation on passenger rights. So if you miss an airplane, what sort of compensation can you be entitled to as a European citizen? So you coordinate with other directors general, you meet members of parliament or their assistants, you could be talking with airline executives. That's a policy job. If you are dealing, if you are working in a support service, let's say the, the so-called uh, PMO, the paymaster's office, and that means you are, you are dealing with the salaries of EU officials, it's much more of a computer-based and, and administrative kind of job. So really there is a, a huge variation. The good thing is that once you work for an institution, after a year or two, you can move around and you can change jobs and move into different departments while keeping your administrative rights and your salary. All right, how do you apply for an EP group, member of parliament, assistant or advocacy organization? So uh, the truth is to find open positions at the European parliamentary group, these are often not advertised. So this typically goes through different channels 
as long as you are somehow inside the institutions, it's much easier to hear about opportunities for that specific job because it's political and it's really about knowledge, connections and political affinity. On the other hand, some political groups tend to, to advertise these very openly on their websites. So make sure that you track all of these. Uh, conservatives, Greens, uh, typically tend to tend to do this. They, they really put out an open call for, for uh, applicants. And then as long as you see that, you apply and you go through the, the usual the usual steps. And then for, for advocacy organizations, they are also often transparent, uh, especially if that's their vocation to be transparent. So they would put out uh, a, a job notice and you'll be allowed to, uh, to, to go on. So let's look at the couple of questions that I wanted to raise uh, on these slides uh, when you are applying for a job. When you apply, these are typically the things that any employer in EU affairs or perhaps even beyond EU affairs will ask you or they will ask themselves when reading your CV. I use the term CV as the European term. If you are more American focused, this would be the resume, but We'll just stick to the term CV. So do you have the knowledge? Do you have the relevant knowledge that this job requires? Because having a degree in economics doesn't necessarily mean that you have knowledge on uh, how to deploy development aid to uh, the most impoverished uh, African countries. So it needs to be highly, highly relevant. Another aspect, will you do a good job? What is your track record? What are the recommendations that you come with? Uh, how can I trust you as a candidate that you'll be able to perform on the job? So make sure that you address these points. You in try to increase in your cover letter and CV those trust building elements because you worked on some important project. You handled some important uh, clients. You worked with uh, high profile uh, projects. All of this would be important building blocks to prove to an employer that yes, I will do a good job. Just give me a chance, invite me for an interview. Will you be a good fit? If a, if a European trade association has only three staff in their secretariat and you've always worked in large organizations, they might wonder, well, this person knows large system. They worked in the public administration or in a huge consultancy. But we're a team of three. Sometimes you need to do coffee and sometimes you need to lobby a member of the European Parliament. And sometimes you need to work with a CEO of a 2 billion euro company. So it really is a very diverse kind of job. So you need to address that concern up front that culturally you can fit into the organization. Another aspect is, can it work out? Do you have the work permit if you're not an EU citizen? Will it cause me as an employer any administrative trouble to get your documents right? Or let's say if you're a British citizen, what does that mean for an employment in Belgium? Uh, are you available in a month because we urgently need to fill this post or you're only available in six months? So all of these questions can make or break an application. And again, this probably goes beyond EU jobs. It's for any job application, but this is an important aspect that uh, everybody, every employer will be asking themselves and they might be asking you. So let's look at a couple of components of success before we finish off in a couple of minutes. So uh, here are seven fairly random ideas of how you can make your profile work better. One is value at the crossroads. So if you have a, an odd, in a good sense, an odd combination of, uh, in your profile because you're a chemist and a lawyer at the same time. That's a strange mix and that can position you really well for a job. Or if you speak, uh, speak Arabic and you're an expert on uh, mathematical modeling and you want to find a job in EU affairs, that could be an interesting thing for certain EU jobs which require these two skills. So think about your background, what odd mix you could find to position yourself better in the job market. Number two, soft skills and knowledge. Very important that a lot of people are purely focused on the knowledge, the, their 
PhD, their publication, their, their the brainy things, which is really important and obviously highly valued, but do not underestimate the importance of soft skills, of uh, your planning skills, your event management skills, your public speaking skills, your ability to write clearly. All of these are very, very relevant, perhaps even more relevant these days because of uh, the internet and knowledge is more accessible than before but skills are very, very personal. Number three, what each side is looking for. Are you looking for a secure job or are you looking for a decent salary? Or what the employer is looking for is perhaps someone with, who is constantly available because it's a three-month intense project that they really need to get done. Make sure that these expectations and perhaps somewhat hidden agendas are out in the open. Don't make me think, one of my favorite concepts, don't make me wonder. So if you are sending an application to uh, an EU trade association, don't make them wonder whether you fill certain criteria that they expected or that they put in their description. You need to be upfront about it. Do not make them wonder, oh, you wrote that your mailing address is, is in Finland, but we need someone who's based in Brussels. Can you relocate? And this is a question which might be obvious to you, but based on the, their impressions of reading your cover letter and your CV, they start wondering. And then they pick someone else because they say, mm, I'm not sure this person would be willing to relocate. So just adding two or three or words willing to relocate into, their, into your CV or your cover letter immediately dispels any hesitation they might have. So here's just a quick example. Of, uh, of, uh, of a cover letter I often use in presentations like this. Say, this, Mr. Smith, I'm applying to the position of a consultant. I've graduated from the LSE. I speak all these languages. I have three years of experience in EU affairs and just completing a traineeship at the commission. Okay, not bad, but this is too self-centered. The idea is to say, what I have can help you. So I believe my diploma from the LSC can be a great asset to your company. That's why I'm submitting my application. Being fluent in these languages can prove beneficial to you when you interact with those members of European Parliament. So it's turning the narrative of, hey, I'm great, into here's what I know, and this is how it can benefit you. And this is such a basic principle and such a... Uh, uh, an easy principle to apply, and yet many candidates just don't do it. So changing that narrative can have a major impact on your job prospects. Another aspect uh, is, is, again, a very uh, simple simple concept, but I see all the time when I look at CVs or, or, or others consult me, is that they're too abstract. It's really, it's for painters to be abstract. You need to be very specific. Again, a very simple example here, if the screen loads. So saying, I know many languages. This is just not good. This is very, very vague. Or saying that I'm an expert in EU environmental policy. Environmental policy is huge. It's a vast knowledge area. You need to be far more specific than that. Or saying that I have several years of experience working on EU structural funds. What does that mean? Did you manage projects? Did you Were you responsible for budgets? What numbers are we talking about? How many countries were involved? Which specific EU structural funds were you handling? So this really needs to be far more concrete. And similarly to, to the previously mentioned ideas is what's in it for you, what's in it for me? And really focusing very, very strictly on the employer why they should hire you, what are the benefits that you're going to bring, instead of saying, I would like this job because this would help me enhance my understanding of European affairs. This would greatly improve my skills in negotiating with international teams. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen sentences like that, and it's just way too self-centered. It, it's not going to do the trick. So you need to be focused on the benefits you're going to bring to the employers. And then last but not least, uh, make sure your online presence is properly vetted 
and uh, when they look at your LinkedIn or just search your name, which again is not necessarily legal, but certainly most employers do it, they will find stuff that is consistent with the image you're trying to project to the employer. So with that, I'll stop here and we have three more minutes, which um, enables me to answer a couple of other questions. So can you repeat the name of the EU transparency repositorium, please? Yes, so the Joint Transparency Register. And if you just put EU Joint Transparency Register, you'll find it immediately. We'll try to put that into our follow-up notes. Uh, and that's basically a directory of all organizations that want to lobby the EU. So they are required to register and declare their website, the issues that they are interested in, and the staff that is dedicated to lobbying. And that is very helpful when you're looking for organizations you'd like to, to target as, a, as an employee or future employee, because it helps you find organizations you may not have thought about before. Should we mention? And personal information such as age, nationality, or CV, something with like webinar, <clears throat> but uh, age uh, and and age might be a, a personally sensitive information. And in some countries, I don't know if that's even legal. Uh, certainly, uh, in the Brussels bubble, this would not be a real issue in the sense that you can mention your age whether that helps or doesn't help your application really depends on the employer most employers would declare that they are an equal opportunity employer so they would not want to uh, discriminate anyone based on their age or other personal attributes um is the eu hiring interim airs uh, now during the coronavirus crisis so for those of you who may not be familiar interim airs is not something i mentioned before they this is uh, short-term contracts, typically up to two months, renewable, up to two months, through a rec through an employment agency. So uh, I'm I don't recall right now the name of the company that typically does it. So interim air is when somebody had, let's say, an accident or medical leave, and they very urgently need to fill in those posts, typically on clerical, secretarial kind of jobs, and uh, 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 an yeah, somebody here, I see Anna mentioning manpower. It's not manpower, but an agency like manpower is the one that typically handles this interim air. Uh, Runstat, that's it. Thanks so much, Audrey. So it's a Runstat uh, that helps uh, that helps uh, hiring uh, with interim airs. So you might call them up and ask whether they have any open positions or something that you could, you could target. Does nationality play a role when selecting? And this question applies both to institutions and, and those outside. Uh, yes and no. Uh, in the sense that EU institutions are trying to keep a relatively fair geographical balance when it comes to the nationality of the staff. So they wouldn't want to have 40% Germans and uh, say... Uh, 30 percent uh, Maltese and then the the remaining would be distributed among other countries so depending on the size of the country the population uh, and then looking at the staff it's a very delicate issue of what percentage of nationalities are represented especially because some nationalities are are relatively overrepresented for senior management whereas others are overrepresented for uh for uh, secretary jobs or clerical tasks or assistance. But generally, they try to keep some sort of a balance. When it comes to non-EU organizations, NGOs, think tanks, consultancies, and obviously private companies with their EU lobbyists, they usually look at your language knowledge, your background, and perhaps uh, they want some diversity on their teams coming from different countries. So I think with that, I'll stop here. And I know that there are quite a few other questions which uh, we'll come back to. And I very, very much thank you for staying all the way. Truly appreciate your time and your attention. And hopefully this was helpful and gave you a couple of ideas and a better understanding of, of how to find jobs in EU careers. 
And uh, do let us know if we can be helped with something else. If you have suggestions for topics that we should address, let us know. We're always uh, happy to, to answer your questions and come up with topics which are, which are of interest to the broader community out there. Uh, let me turn on the camera just to say bye. Thanks again for being here and uh, stay safe. Most of you should stay at home and uh, hopefully everything is going to work out fine. We have this webinar series uh, each week until pretty much until May. All of this is for free. We're trying to help uh, the community there. So spread the news, spread the word, share the recording, share the presentations, and uh, send us questions and feedback of how can be, we be more helpful. So thanks again also to the team in Budapest. Stay safe and hopefully see you next week virtually. Take care.